Legislators are very conscious of the fact that they are often leaders in setting policy that other people will, will pick up on. I came from a family of very high political involvement. None of them ever ran for office or anything, but we followed politics very closely. And my family always had dinner together and we talked about politics. So it kind of was a natural step for me. I got elected to the House of Representatives for the 1973 session. I was one of 28 freshmen out of 60. The old adage about freshmen having to stay in the background and wait their turn, there were too many of us that they couldn't do that. And I actually got a chairmanship of a committee, which before that just hadn't happened. Little did I know what historic session that was gonna turn out to be. There never had been before, and I don't think has been since, a session like the 1973 session in terms of major legislation. Sunshine laws. We passed the laws, the open meetings laws and open records laws. Landlord tenant law. A lot of bills on consumer protection. We established Metro, one major piece of legislation after the other. Norma Paulus was one of those people for me. Now, that was back in the days when a freshman Democrat and a sophomore Republican, one could be the mentor of the other. It's absolutely unthinkable now. But uh, Norma was a, a, a good friend of mine, and I trusted her judgment, and uh, she and I got along really well, and uh, I would ask, often ask her, you know, what was the, how did this bill work? How did that bill work? How should I vote on this or that? I was uh, named to the Energy and Environment Committee, and uh, the Speaker of the House, Dick Eyman, uh, was kind of a jokester. They only put two men on the committee, uh, Ralph Groner and me, and the rest of the committee was all women. Nancy Fadley from Eugene was the chair. We passed a whole bunch of women's rights legislation. That was the first time any of this stuff had happened. You know, allowing women to have their own credit cards, allowing women to change their name, allowing women to have insurance. I forget all the things, but just a real raft of women's rights legislation that we passed. It was, it was fun. We passed Senate Bill 100 out of that committee. Um, my role in that was rather minor. The bill came over from the Senate, and it had passed by one vote. Ted Hallett came to me and he said that Vicatia had changed his mind and was going to vote no if it came back. So what the way the legislature works, a bill has to pass in exactly the same language in both houses in order to become law. So if it leaves one house, goes to the second house, and amendments made to that bill, then it has to go back to the first house, where the first house would agree or not to agree in that, those amendments, the, the phrases concur or not concur. So he said, Atia will, will not concur and the bill will die. So he said, your job, Stephen, is very simple. No changes, don't change a comma. And Mary Burroughs from Eugene, a very liberal uh, Republican, was kind of intrigued by the League of Cities. Uh, they said we should let cities as well as counties do comprehensive plans. And I said, no, <laughs> no, we're not going to. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to change anything. Keep it exactly the same as it was. We kept it the same as it was. The bill passed and uh, the rest is history. There was a, a, a law case called the Fasano decision. That was the court case that really defined how this legislation was going to work and the way that the state would make general policy outlines and then the counties with their goals and guidelines. And then the counties would adopt comprehensive plans for their own individual needs but in those comprehensive plans and their zoning, they had to follow the goals and guidelines set up by LCDC. We thought that was going to be a model legislation for the rest of the country. Unfortunately, no, nobody ever uh, took it. it it's a, a tough row to hoe to go against landed interests. A lot of what I did in the legislature was I always say that people like Earl Blumen and Vera Katz were, were like the quarterbacks and the running backs. And I was like the lineman that made things happen. I would take somebody else's idea and put it, get a set for a hearing, bring in 
uh, witnesses, make amendments, line up votes, do all the nitty gritty stuff to take from a concept to getting a bill passed. That, that was really, as I saw my role in the legislature. Dick Iman, the speaker, came to me and said, I want you to do two things. I want you to bring the drinking age down to 18, and I want you to legalize marijuana. So uh, I did. We did get a bill out of committee um, to legalize, legalize marijuana, and it got a really good vote in the House. There was a guy named Stafford Hansel, who was a Republican from Eastern Oregon, who was literally the big, biggest pig farmer in the world. He was a hugely respected, across the aisle, uh, gentleman. And uh, he got up, although he was a very conservative Republican, on the floor of the House and ha had with him a bottle of whiskey and a pack of cigarettes and a can of beer and a cigarette, marijuana cigarette that state police had given him. And he went through saying what the dangers of all these things were. And then he pointed out that, you know, marijuana is really a pretty harmless thing and why we allow people to use these and don't do that. So the bill came very close to passing, but it lost by a couple of votes. After it lost, a number of legislators came up to me and said, we really wanted to do something that went a little too far. Can you give us a compromise? So I got on the phone, I talked to some district attorneys around the state, and I say, what happens? A young person gets arrested for a small amount of marijuana. What actually happens to that person? Well, it's a misdemeanor, so they get a criminal record the rest of their life. $100 fine, n no jail time. I, I talked to Norma Paulus about that, and she said, well, in 1971, they had done a big uh, revision of the criminal code. And one thing they added there, what was called a violation. Now, a violation is an offense that's not a criminal offense, like a traffic ticket, <clears throat> but it does show that something is against the law, it just doesn't give you a criminal record. So I took those ideas together and I put a bill together that said if you get caught with less than an ounce of marijuana uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be a fine of $100, it'll be a violation, so there's no criminal offense. But the bill passed, uh, the House pretty overwhelmingly passed the Senate, and Tom McCall uh, was really concerned. He said, I found out later. Uh, you know, I'm going to get a whole host of letters from all over the state saying, please veto this bill. It's a terrible, terrible bill. So he had a whole bunch of letters pre-printed pre and ready to go out. Well, he got 12 letters, six in favor and six opposed. It was, it was not that big a deal. Uh, but it saved a lot of Oregonian youngsters uh, from going to jail and from having, probably most of them went to go to jail, but they had a criminal record that trying to get a job later or trying to get housing would help. Oregon is an interesting state. Uh, everybody has the opportunity to be involved at the level that they want. And I often said, you know, I've been on a first name basis with governors before I was in the legislature. And anybody who wants to be, can be. And anybody who wants to go in and see the governor, who wants to go in and see the legislator, there's no guard at the door uh, in the Capitol building. You just go in. You make an appointment often because they're busy. But there's, uh, you can get in touch with them with email and write them letters. You can call them on the telephone. Uh, you can gather a group together and go visit as a group. Lots and lots of opportunities. And uh, Oregon's a very open state that way. It's really easy to, uh, to become involved.